name is Lauren Napier, and I am your moderator for today. I'm program director of the Center for Spacefaring Civilization, and we are here today with Dr. Thomas Cheney, who is the executive director for the Center for Spacefaring Civilization and is a lecturer at um, Open University in the Astrobiology OU department. And we also have with us Professor Christopher Newman, who is with the Northumbria University Law Department and one of our advisors at the Center for Spacefaring Civilization. Um, just a few housekeeping. As Thomas mentioned in the chat, we'll be recording the session and there will be a question and answer session at the end. So what we're going to do is if you will be so kind as to write your questions as you think of them into the chat function, I will then um, ask them on your behalf at the end. And there's a little, if you hover over the, um, the chat of the person who's written the question and you like theirs, you can do a thumbs up or a heart if it's something that's similar to what you would ask or is similar to what um, you are interested in. That way we can kind of take the, the most, um, I guess, viewed or interested questions at the top first. Um, so first I'll just say that today we are discussing the Space Resources Primer 2020, which Thomas will talk about in a moment. Uh, the Center for Space Spring Civilization is an independent think tank and research center where we focus on space governance um, from an international and national different perspectives. And we address what needs to be done in order for humanity to become a space faring civilization. We use a holistic and multidisciplinary view of the space field and we try to promote the sustainable and equitable use of space. Um, while we are based in the UK, we do have volunteers that are from all over the world and we operate digitally and internationally and as transparent and respectful as possible. So I will leave it now to Thomas to give his quick keynote on a, a primer on space mining law, understanding the laws on space resources five years after the US Title IV law came into effect. So Thomas, please, the floor is yours. All right, excellent. I'm going to try and share my screen because it's a simple PowerPoint, but it is a PowerPoint nonetheless. Uh, right. So the idea behind this thing first uh, uh, sort of evolved over the course of the year, but uh, essentially it, it derived from the fact that I, I realized that it's the fifth anniversary of uh, US Title IV, uh, which is the section of the Commercial Space Launch Competitiveness Act. Uh, the sort of kind of kicked off this whole interest in, in space mining by saying that US citizens are able to uh, take ownership over resources which they have extracted. Um, and there's been a lot of developments over those past five years um, from we've now seen several other countries uh, introduce national legislation uh, such as the United Arab such as the United Arab Emirates or Luxembourg. Uh, Japan is going to do it within the next couple of weeks or months, assuming that the bill goes through the diet without any problems. There's been tremendous amounts of discussion at UN COPUS and other forums. Uh, there's been lots and lots of discussion on Twitter. Um, and then we've had uh, other organizations such as the Hague Space Governance Working Group, which I was involved in, uh, but also other groups such as the Vancouver Group, which produced their own recommendations. And so the idea behind this uh, primer is to provide a, a general overview of everything that's gone on, largely focusing on the sort of the legal and policy developments. Um, but the idea is that, you know, if you're coming to this and you perhaps don't know anything about space mining, you can read it and go, ah, oh, that's what's going on. That's what these guys are talking about. That's why they're arguing about Article 2 all the time. Uh, now I understand. Um, it's, it's not meant to be like academically comprehensive or anything like that. It's, it's, it's supposed to be reasonably accessible. And hopefully we've achieved that. Um, hopefully we'll be able to uh, build on this in the future because presumably there are going to be further developments uh, down the road. We will see. Um, and obviously uh, with politics changing in the United States a lot uh, over the last couple of weeks, uh, <laughs> think things may change dramatically or they may not change all that much. We will, may have to wait and see. Um, but it's, it's and so the reason for today is today is actually the fifth anniversary of Congress passing Title IV. Uh, and it was being set, it was sent to President Obama today. Um, it didn't actually become law until the 25th, uh, but as it's the day before Thanksgiving, we thought it was perhaps best not to, to hold uh, the, this webinar on next week. Um, but it, next week is also significant for us at the center um, because we will, we're celebrating our third anniversary next week as well um, and to see the developments. 
Um, and as somebody who's been working on space mining for you know, the better part of the past five years, uh, it's been fantastic to sort of see the developments and, and a lot of uh, the things that you know, have happened over the last five years, I've been able to personally see, or in my own sort of modest way, I've actually been involved in such as that the Hague group. Um, so it's, it's a fascinating time. Um, so I think the, the sort of first question that's worth asking is, what is settled? And a kind of a corollary is that is, is anything settled now? Um, you know, if you if you're a space law enthusiast or, or scholar or student, you know, you're aware that there's a lot of discussions that have happened over the years uh, regarding, you know, is space mining legal? How does it work given the non-appropriation principle of Article 2 of the Outer Space Treaty? Um, you know, does the freedom of use found in Article 1 mean that, you know, you can go and take space resources? Are they like fish in the oceans, as people keep uh, re referring to, um, including myself? That's an analogy I often overuse. Um, so I'm guilty of that one, too. Uh, and I was actually rereading um, Andrew Haley and um, Myers McDougall's uh, 1960, early 1960s space law textbooks uh, the other day. And I re it occurred to me that they were they're having the same argument uh, about uh, a national approach to regulating space resources versus an international approach to regulating space resources that we're having uh, today. So there is that kind of question of, well, is anything settled? And I think the answer to that, helpfully as it may be or may not be, is both yes and no. Um, I think we can now reasonably say that there, there is an acceptance that the freedom of use in Article 1 of the Outer Space Treaty does allow for the utilization of space resources. I think the question has shifted more from is the extraction and use of space resources uh, permissible under the Outer Space Treaty to who has the authority or the legitimacy to approve that utilization. Um, and so it's almost like the question has shifted from being a question about Article 1 of the Outer Space Treaty to more of a question of Article 2 of the Outer Space Treaty. And we see that with, say, you know, the reactions, particularly by the Russian Federation, but there are other countries as, as well in terms of their response, that it's not necessarily that they object to the concept of space mining in principle um, or, or the, the, the idea of itself. It's not as if they're, they're arguing for space remaining this pristine, untouched wilderness. Um, but they're saying that the United States government, in, under its own authority, doesn't have the legitimacy to say to you know an American company that they can go and mine the moon or an asteroid. Um, obviously, the United States uh, rejects that um, position, and, and they've long rejected that position. This isn't a particularly new uh, position for the, for the U.S. government. And it's also interesting to, to see uh, how positions differ because the Russia in particular tends to be a rather uh, vocal supporter of, of the rights of state sovereignty. Um, but in this issue, uh, they're arguing for a, a more communal approach by the international community. Um, and you do have to wonder whether there are perhaps some sort of geopolitical or economic considerations in there, in that you know, Russia isn't exactly going to be leading the way in, in space resources, and yet, and that yet they have quite a resource dependent national economy. Um, so, you know, to answer these questions that I've posed, what is settled? Is anything settled? Um, you know, again, it, yes and no. We have seen developments. We have seen important developments. Um, but there's still a lot to develop. And that will be a common theme uh, throughout this presentation. And in fact, it's a common theme throughout the primer that, you know, this is, this is I wouldn't even necessarily say that this is Act 1. This is the end of Scene 1, Act 1. Um, and we've still got a long way to go. Um, so sort of second sort of key element that I would, I would like to highlight uh, of the development over the last five years is this question of do we allow a, a, a profusion of like a bunch of national regimes or do we need an international overarching regime? Um, or as a, a, as a common meme often suggests, is it both? And I think with the recent Artemis Accords, um, we're seeing that actually both is probably the way that we're going, uh, we are going to go. Um, of course, we may see international regimes, plural, rather than one overarching international regime, and that's a, an interesting potential development uh, that, that we need to watch out for. Um, but 
regulation of commercial and private space activities has been done at the national level for decades now. That That is the approach to say. That is the logic of Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty, that uh, individual states take responsibility for their private sectors. Um, while we do have coordination at the international level in, say, for example, the International Telecommunications Union, which coordinates the use of radio frequency spectrum, um, you know, UNUSA is not the international seabed authority, um, and it was never intended to be, and I don't think anybody wants it to be. Um, so we are going to see national regimes that is entirely appropriate and in line with how we regulated virtually every other space activity going. Um, there does need to be coordination and cooperation. Um, you know, again, that's inherent to the space regime. That's what the, treat, the Outer Space Treaty actually calls for, is cooperation and coordination. Um, and you know, the nature of the space environment, again, lends itself to the fact that you, know, you need to talk to the other users of the outer space environment to make sure that you're uh, able to operate safely and effectively. Um, and and you know, again, the, the states that are proposing, the, the states that have pushed for uh, national space uh, resource regimes have never been opposed to, the, to this national international cooperation uh, thing. And again, we're see, now we actually have a firm proposal on the table in the form of the Artemis Accords uh, to implement just such a sort of international a cooperative regime for coordinating activities. Now, it'll be interesting to see whether we see any alternatives uh, to the Artemis Accords proposed. Um, you know, again, early days yet, uh, only, only certain months, and, it, and it's we do have to question how much not having a copious meeting this year has impacted uh, some of these developments. Um, but this is sort of again, you know, the debate has changed, I and mean, I think that's one of the big things to say that you know the developments over the last five years has changed the nature of what it is we're discussing. We're no longer discussing those sort of fundamental principles of can you do this within the Outer Space Treaty? It's now shifted more to the question of how do you do this within the Outer within the, within the Outer Space Treaty? Um, and so I've sort of touched on this already a bit, but you know, the, here's the question of, well, what is next? And I think one of the biggest things for me in terms of what's next is we now need to start figuring out the details. Um, you know, we're, we're coming to grips with the principles. Is this permissible under the Outer Space Treaty? Is it compatible with the Outer Space Treaty? You know, are national regimes acceptable? Um, you know, and, and the answers to those questions are, are tending towards the positive. Um, but now we need to figure things out. So safety zones have come up quite a lot, um, whether they were in the Hague building blocks, uh, they're now in the Artemis Accords. But what do we mean by a safety zone? Um, what does a safety zone need to look like? Um, does a safety zone on the moon going to be different from a safety zone on the asteroids? Is it going to be different from a safety zone on Mars? Um, and you know, that's, I think, where you know, that's where we're going to start to see the, the, discuss, the space law discussion move to and where it needs to move to. But the biggest problem we have there is there's still an awful lot of unknowns about how space resource activities are going to be conducted. You know, no one has done this yet. Any potential precedents that we can point to are relatively minor uh, sample return missions, uh, whether it be to an asteroid or a comet or you know the Apollo missions. So the mechanics of what's actually involved in uh, extracting these resources from these bodies uh, is pretty much unknown, um, and it becomes hard to create a regulatory regime when you don't know uh, what you know anything really. Um, and and so I think as much as uh, the entrepreneurial community or the engineering community likes to complain about law holding uh, them back, uh, they need to start providing some answers so that we can start to provide uh, the actual regulations uh, for this activity. Um, that will take time. I don't anticipate that happening anytime soon. Um, I think we're talking decades, uh, if not even longer, um, before we start being able to answer some of these questions. Um, but you know, we are now moving into an area where we need to start even just thinking about them. Um, and that's, again, been a big shift from the past five years. Even if no actual space resource activities have taken place yet, you know, we are now starting moving from talking about purely hypothetical concepts to actually being able to start to think about the, the sort of nitty gritty actual details of what this entails. Uh, let's stop sharing my screen. Um, and I think it's hopefully that, that provides a, a reasonable uh, foundation for uh, a conversation. Uh, guided by Lauren. All right, thanks, Thomas. So I've already done my homework and I've got some questions. And then again, if any of you have questions, please put them in the chat 
So after I ask mine in the more panel discussion, we can have a more open discussion with all of you. So the first one um, is what are exactly the resources on the moon and what would be the purpose of using these resources in the situation that we are seeing perhaps with Artemis program or just um, in general? Yeah, I think that's that's a brilliant um, opening question because we see a lot of um, what's the word? Um, we see a lot of sort of like excited headlines about you know trillion dollar asteroids and and the like. Um, and you know, as as well, everyone who's read John Lewis's uh, 1997 book will know there's a lot of material in the solar system to get excited about. Um, but the primary resource that most of the other companies are looking at is water uh, in various different forms, depending on what body you're talking about, uh, to be broken down into its components to be used as rocket fuel or, or provide life support materials for a satellite uh, thing. I think in a longer term, we might start to talk about metals, but metals require a whole chain, supply chain that, that's gonna complicate things. You know, you've gotta smelt them and turn them into something useful and transport them to where they need to be. Um, and then you get into the whole thing, especially when you start looking at asteroids. There's a geology there that gets complicated um, because they, it is a different gravity. So you're not necessarily going to find ore like you do on Earth. Um, and that might, that might change the economics altogether. Um, and then there's the fantastical stuff like the, the helium-3, um, which I think you know doesn't even really be fair worth uh, thinking about because you, know, it's the, you need to invent the sci-fi tech <laughs> in, in order to, for that to be, even be worth thinking about. Um, so once once somebody's got a fusion reactor that utilizes helium three up and running, then we'll worry about that. Um, but water is the big thing. Okay, so now I'm going to jump to a legal question. And Chris, if you don't mind starting to get your insight, we heard a little bit from Thomas, but I know that Article Two of the Outer Space Treaty talks about non-appropriation. Um, what are the international views here with regards to resource utilization versus this Article Two principle? Well, I'm going to start off with by saying if you haven't had a chance to look at the Space Resources Primer, I think it's fantastic. Uh, I'm going to say now, Thomas, if you don't mind, I'm going to point my students in the direction of it as well, because I think it provides a really interesting, uh, relevant as well, and, and also sort of comprehensive guide to the, to the issues that I think we're going to need to think about going forward. And I think Thomas hit the nail on the head during his presentation. The discussion is, is in a state of flux. Article two is, is was very much seen as, as the barrier between, you know, resource utilization and, and and the untold trillions in the galaxy. You can't use it because it's appropriation. And what we've done is we've sort of unpicked that and we've looked at Article one instead and said, well, hang on, this is just usage. We're not looking to we're not looking to own these celestial bodies. We're not looking to put territorial flags in. We're not looking to do any of that. What we're seeking to do is to use it. And mining is a perfectly decent use of a resource. So there's the first sort of dimension to that. There is a slight complication in, in English law. I'll talk about English law for a second, because that's the sort of the jurisdiction I'm a prisoner of, if, you, if you'll forgive me. Um, but in English law, one of, the, one of the ultimate acts of appropriation is destruction. And it may be that certain resources, certain asteroids need to be what, what's euphemistically being called processed, but, you know, reduced to rubble and the resources extracted. So what we've got here, I think, is a bit of a continuum rather than fixed points of that's appropriation, that's not appropriation. I think what, what we're on here is something of a continuum where going to the moon and using the using the water that's there or or even a, a, another sort of resource that might be there is a location the peaks of eternal light where we can get unlimited solar energy from that's clearly usage and i think we'll know it when we see it so if it if it walks like helium three and talks like helium three then it's helium three you know and, and i think we're going to be very much looking at it from the perspective of what is the use it's being put to you know is that usage overly destructive, overly intrusive. And then I think we'll start getting a picture of the interplay between Article 1 and Article 2. And I don't think that interplay is going to end anytime soon. So, you know, Thomas, would it, do you think that covers it off? Yeah, I think, I think also the other aspects of Article 1 are going to come in. 
play and they often get ignored and that's the in the interest of all countries and and activities should be you know are the province of of all humankind um and like you know there's been some you know we've, we've written plenty of stuff on what well what does that mean and we can talk about what that means in terms of earth orbit but i think when it comes to resources there's certainly uh questions now i don't think you know mandatory benefit sharing fits it again within the model that we've done um of practice over the past 60 years but i also think it means that you know you can't just use space resources for whatever you want i think it was james schwartz uses the example of you know well maybe you can't have a pool on the moon because how how is that for the benefit of humankind um and so i think that's a, a an element that may have to come into consideration of what you should put in these resources to all right uh, the next question is a little bit, well, the next two questions are a little bit more U.S. focused. So, Thomas, if you'd like to start on this one, do you see the United States as a norm entrepreneur for space resource utilization? And what emerging norms are we seeing or going to see related to the space resource utilization? Um, I mean, I suppose by enacting, being the first to enact the law, they, they are a norms entrepreneur by default. Um, I mean, I think, you know, Del delving into the, the the legislative process that gave rise to the the title four in the first place um it was you know lobby actions by congressmen that got it onto the agenda that got it processed this wasn't you know uh, an initiative by president obama uh, by any means um I don't, so i don't know whether that's that's relevant um there's certainly you know under the trump administration there's certainly been a, a drive to, to push this, you know, and, and we've seen the results in the, in the Artemis Accords, um, as well as an executive order that says, you know, that reaffirms this position that Americans are able to um, appropriate, you know, to take ownership over space resources. Um, but yeah, and I think, and I think that's the thing, there's, there's this gap. Luxembourg seems to have been the more vocal um, and, and better at positioning themselves internationally. Now, maybe that's, there's a, there's a sensible politics there. You know, every, every time the Americans do something, we always see the, the kind of anti-imperialist rhetoric that America's trying to annex the solar system, um, which there are some people who want to annex, who want to make the moon the 51st American state, but I don't think that's the main thrust of, of these initiatives. Um, so I think, yes, they are pushing the boundaries, um, but I don't necessarily know that there is or have been until the Artemis Accords as leadery as perhaps you might expect from the United States, but that might be smart politics. Um, Chris, can you maybe then mention if we've already kind of established they are at least one of the, the entrepreneurs leading the way, what, what norms do you see around this topic? Are there any, are there some emerging? What ones can we use from space law already that would be applicable? And I think this is where we turn our focus very clearly to the Artemis Accords, because I think they identify the norms that we can say are, you know, are, are, are being recognised, almost the low hanging fruit in normative terms. You know, I don't think anyone would argue that there is this this need for, for safety of operations. I think interoperability also goes kind of hand in hand with that. The recognition that we, you know, we've made a mess in, in Earth orbit, let's try not to do the same in lunar orbit. That's more an aspiration than a norm, I would suggest, because I think once it comes to putting lunar infrastructure in place, we're going to very quickly realise, well, well, we need a GPS system there. That's going to involve some satellites. Let's have a communications network. That's going to involve some satellites. So I think that's going to be aspirational rather than a, a norm that we can say that is behaviour that we're looking to control. But on the other side, there is the mitigation of that. So we can we can look towards that as well. I think the the biggest I hesitate using the word norm here because it's it's very much not. But I think the most reassuring thing that we're hearing, the, the most reassuring mood music that we're getting, is that this is looking to be done under the under the existing international order. And I, I again there's a little sort of asterisk there because moon agreement does not apply here. So it's it's looking to be done under the existing international order, the existing outer space treaty regime. We're looking to impart that. So if we think of that as the foundational principles, 
we're then we're, we're getting another set of, of more granular foundational principles. The Adams Accords still aren't operational, I don't think. There's still there's still not that detail of okay, what standards are we going to use? How are we going to ensure interoperability? To what extent are ISO going to be involved? Spectrum usage. Let's not even think about spectrum usage. So there are a number of questions to to, to come from that, and I think this is the thing that we're seeing with with the discussion on space resources. We're coming down from the big. It's almost the question's been answered. Can we do it? Should we do it? Because the answer comes back, well, yes. You know, that's, I think, now an unarguable point. Um, you know, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I'll leave that to, to the space ethicists to decide. But we're now at the stage where, OK, it's going to happen. How are we going to make it happen? And I think we're looking at these norms of safety. We're looking at the norms of you know, interoperability. We're looking at the norms of managing the environment to make sure that it is as sustainable as possible. All right. So the next one, I have a little preface. Um, I read today that previously when Biden was vice president, um, he was able to help uh, the former head of NASA, um, Charlie Bolden, get funding for commercial crew programs. So he does have an interest in human space flight, it would seem. However, with Biden as the president-elect, we know that Brian Stein has now mentioned that he will be stepping down because he doesn't feel like he's the right fit for NASA under the new presidency. Um, we also know that Biden will most likely focus on Earth observation because of climate change and climate crisis issues, as well as the ever-present COVID pandemic that we're dealing with. How do you see space resource utilization and the continuation of the Artemis program moving forward? And I ask you to include consideration of international partners and non-state actors specifically because you are from the UK, which is one of the Artemis partners at this time. So Thomas, if you'd like to start. Yeah, I think, I mean, you know, I, I hate crystal balling, especially for, for foreign countries, um, even if I, I'm reasonably familiar with the US politics. Um, I think the, the challenge is, is, you know, are are we experiencing, say, a Nixon moment in which, you know, he's going to champion the Artemis Accords, but kind of slowly let it die um, because there's money to be spent on other things. And I think particularly at this moment in time, it's difficult to, to make that assessment because like the economy, everyone's economy is going to fall off the cliff if it hasn't already. Um, there's, there, you know, e even without a sort of for the political winds changing, there's going to be tremendous pressure to cut back on, on spending because you know we're just we're hemorrhaging money on on everything at the moment and tax revenues are way down and you know, you're already hearing uh, Americans talking about the deficit the deficit and they do have a pretty big deficit that needs to be addressed. Um, you know I think the international nature of the Artemis program will probably be at saving grace because a new administration, particularly one that wants to sort of reassure international partners that we're not the Trump administration. Um, is unlikely to renege on the, the promises and arrangements that have already been made. But we might see them nitpicking those, you know, or we will adhere to the letter of what has been agreed rather than necessarily the spirit of it. Um, I, you know, I don't know. It's not going to be a priority for any new administration. There's going to be budget constraints. Um, I think that the commercial crew, the commercial sector could have a role. There's, there's now a lobby. Um, that have an interest in this. And that's been a saving grace for um, the American Space Program before, because it, this is a lot of jobs, often in politically key constituencies, uh, which I understand is by design. Um, so that could be relevant, particularly given that President Biden will be facing a divided Congress, assuming that the Georgia Senate seats uh, go the way that, that they're predicted to go. Um, so uh, unfortunately, it's going to be another one of those. We'll wait and see. There's reasons to be optimistic, but you know, as is the one to 2020, there are reasons to be pessimistic. Um, I would just like to um, make a point about your previous question. I think it's sort of relevant to this one as well. Is to um, like praise the relevance of civil society groups, um, and that you know, particularly in sort of space safety, we're, we're seeing that. But in the Artemis Accords, the the fingerprints of both the Hague Working Group. Uh, and for all mankind are sort of all over this document. Um, and so that's, that's uh, and, and we, there are other groups in the space industry, uh, you know, the Space Safety Coalition or CONFERS, uh, you know, we are seeing a rise in these sort of uh, civil society standard setting bodies that promote sort of good practice. 
and internationally, and clearly they're being listened to. Um, so I, I think you know, we will see a broader uh, approach uh, than we have perhaps previously. Chris, would you like to add in? I mean, Thomas has covered it off. The, the, it, COVID, the impact of COVID isn't just the elephant in the room, it's the entire zoo. We are literally looking at unknown economic circumstances that are going to have repercussions for, for decades to come. I think that's going to be more injurious to resource utilization and to space programs than pretty much anything else we can we can think about. So I think to, to quote or to paraphrase Tony Blair, we live in an era of low predictability. And I think that predictability is going to get lower and lower as the economics start to bite. And, and that's where we're at. It's about the money. And, and it always has been. Um, so thinking about that, how COVID and, you know, the, the continuing climate crisis is is changing things as well as now we're transitioning through a new U.S. government and they've got their own budgeting challenges, which made all to, to collectively delay going to the moon past the 2024 mark. What could or should the international community do during this time, like legally to achieve what you think would be a successful space resource utilization? Um, Chris, you want to start and then we'll defer to Thomas. Yeah, I think the one thing that we're seeing, and it is an increasingly polarised world, it's a world that's becoming fractured by, by COVID, by these, keep the conversations going. More than the, more than the law, more than, the, more than anything else, keep the talking going, keep discussion groups going. Thomas, Thomas mentioned the civil societies, keep the interaction between that and government, keep the space community all talking together. Even at times of fierce, furious international tension, we still see China, Russia, the UK, Germany, America, we still see these countries talking to each other. I would like to see that conversation broadened out. And I think we could see it, you know, having having discussions in Africa, having discussions in South America, really getting voices heard that in space terms haven't been heard for, for for long enough. We need to start broadening the conversation out. The space community I've seen is, you know, it does have this, this listening sort of feel to it. So forget the law, forget the policy, the conversations. That's where I think the future for this lies. Absolutely. I, I agree. And I, I think, you know, as, as I said in my presentation, part of the challenge on further regulatory details is we need to know what we're regulating before we can figure out how to do that. Um, so in addition to everything Chris has suggested, I, I also think investing in R&D, um, let's get tech developed, let's get tech um, demonstrators developed. And I think, you know, I mean, we obviously don't know what will happen with the Artemis program, but I think we are starting to see that. You know, NASA is taking in situ resource utilization in support of their missions seriously and have been for some time. Uh, we've seen, I think it was yesterday, the, the European Space Agency and, and Luxembourg Space Agency have now launched this Center for Space Resource Innovation, uh, which sounds like it's going to be doing exactly that. Um, and it won't provide all of the answers, but once you start going, ah, oh, this is maybe how you take an asteroid apart to get up the, what, the bits you want, we can start to think about, you know, okay, well, how big does the safety zone need to be? All right. Um, my next question is, as we're in the UK, a UK perspective, I read recently in um, the media that there's a UK company, if I say it correctly, Medalysis which has won an ESA contract to develop tech to turn moon regolith into oxygen, which would then leave the other metal, metal, uh, metals for building in a construction sense. Um, what does this mean for the space resource utilization in the UK space economy? And is there going to then be a policy strategy for this um, with or without ESA as we move into post-Brexit? Whoever wants to take that one first. <laughs> yeah, I think the first thing to say is that um, European Brexit shouldn't impact uh, the UK's relationship with ESA. Um, now, there, there are caveats to attach to that because of ESA's growing relationship with the European Commission, and there will be logistical facts, given the fact that the majority of ESA members are also EU member states. Um, and so that could complicate things. You know, we've seen that with the Galileo and Copernicus programs already. Um, but broadly speaking, it shouldn't impact. You know, there are there are several 
ESA members who are not EU member states, or, although they are attached to the EU in some way. So it's caveated that that declaration. Um, as for what does this mean for the UK policy? I mean, it's, it's you know I've had the conversations with people in the UK government for years now, and it's it's never quite clear what exactly whether there's a plan or or who's who's interested and what have you. Um, I've long been on the view, because like, well, this is one of the questions that often comes up for me when I talk to people within government, does the UK need its own space resources law? And my answer is, I don't think so. I think, you know, especially, you know, now we've now added the UAE and Japan to the list of countries with space resources laws. And I think, you know, at some point you're going to start to see an overcrowded marketplace. Um, and the countries like the United Kingdom should look at, well, what do we do well? And, you know, we, we're well situated within the supply to be a supplier um, of expertise, of equipment, um, you know, of insurance products, legal advice, um, whatever. These are the things that we do well. Um, and so we should aim to do that within the space resources industry. Um, you know, and, and the little the, the little quip I, I would always say about that is the people who really made money during the gold rush are the guys who sold the shovels. <clears throat> Okay, Chris, it's you. <laughs> Do you want to add? Okay. Um, again, uh, Thomas covers everything with you know um, alacrity and with, uh, with 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 intelligence. I will just add my little piece to this that I think he's exactly right in terms of where the UK can position itself in the space resources game is not clear yet. I don't. I, I think you know it's missed the early bus. It's missed the early sort of part of the opportunity to be part of it like Luxembourg was I think I think that's gone and I think to be truthful with you it, that type of thing isn't what the UK does anyway as, as Thomas says what we do well is we provide legal expertise we provide um, you know insurance expertise we also manage data well we also are seen as you know good good, good managers of data I think that's going to be really significant going forward we do small satellites. That's, you know, traditionally the UK has been a provider of small satellites. That's something that we should be looking, we should be looking at infrastructure. Thomas is right about the shovel, about the shovels, you know. We should be looking at furnishing the infrastructure. Let the resources take care of themselves. When we're ready to sort of bring down all the gold, then fine, we'll think about it. But it, it's the infrastructure that we can look to provide and that we can look to develop. The relationship with ESA at the minute is very nice because we're a nice contributor. Where that's going to come when the next big EU contract lands, I don't know. And I think that's going to be the, the first stress test of it as well. So I think that, yes, the, the space resources prevents a tremendous presents a tremendous opportunity for the UK, but not in the way that I think the UK would think it does. It just needs to be a little bit savvier the way it approaches it and looks and sees, right, how can we take advantage of what we're really, really good at? If it does that, then there is a genuine opportunity to become infrastructure experts. I think that's that's what we should be looking to to achieve. Excellent. All right, I've got three more questions, and I want to open it up to the floor. Um, I'm going to start here with Chris, actually, because I know you have expertise in ethics. So the space resource utilization on the moon, and I keep saying the moon because it's the closest next thing we're doing with humanity in terms of human spaceflight. So space resource utilization on the moon. And the new evidence of water on the moon, does this change anything from an ethical perspective on how we should approach the use versus the, the conservation or, you know, like the prestige of keeping some parts of the moon the way it's always been for maybe some cultures think of it for religious purposes or we just want to have that that view of the moon as we remember it since the beginning? I think this is one of the conversations that we need to have in parallel with the resource discussion. I think traditionally we've gone ahead because that's the way that the things happen in the space industry. Isn't it? Right. How can we do it? How can we achieve this? What project can we do to get there? Can we get some funding? OK, can we? Oh, is there a regulatory framework? And there's rarely a discussion of, OK, well, what's the impact, the broader societal impact of this? And how, what are the value systems that we're looking to underpin in this activity? Never a question about the underpinning value systems, because I think we're talking about the, the or talking about the ethics of space exploration. I don't think there is a shared understanding of what that term actually means just yet. I think it it means whatever you 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 choose it to mean. It's kind of like sustainability. It's something that we say that's a that's a nice sort of that shows we're 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 not complete heartless capitalist monsters. 
But actually, I'm not so sure there is a shared understanding of, of, of what the ethical framework governing space activity is. I think we've all got moral positions, but morals are individual rather than ethics being the shared group group understanding. So I, th I think this is one of the problems that we have. As you, Thomas mentioned early on, you mentioned early on, Jim Schwartz is doing some great work on this. Um, Tony Milligan has written a really good book on the ownership of the moon from a from an ethical point of view. Of course, a wonderful friend, Alice Gorman, does so much work discussing the locating the humanity in space acti activity. And I think these are the type of conversations that need a, a signal boost in the way that we talk and the way that we discuss, because, you know, I'm a dry old international lawyer. And so I tend to look at treaties and things like that. And I think that misses 95% of what is important in what we're doing. Yeah. And I think. Um, I... Wait, Thomas, I want to throw a caveat in for you because I know you work also on things related to cost par. Please talk about it from a cost par ethics perspective, if you will. Absolutely. Um, so, as, as is often the case, I, I completely agree with Chris. I also think it's, it's kind of interesting. I, I think we've started to see a, a chink in the no ethics discussion in, in the Artemis Accords because there is now this discussion of cultural heritage in space um, and you know full credit to Michelle Hanlon and, and for all mankind uh, I think she's really taken an, an excellent leadership on getting that as a, as a like a political topic onto the agenda um, but you know I think it's also interesting that we, we focus on human heritage as physical objects and you know Alice Gorman does this discussion a lot better than, than either of us can but you know it is that you know we're very much focusing on the the physical human made objects but there's a whole lot of else to like culture the moon is cultural heritage and but there's also like a natural discussion and i know i've, I've seen papers where there's been speculative questions about you know if is, would, would mining change the luminosity of the moon and would that mean that we have a whole bunch of confused birds because a lot of birds use you know uh, stellar navigation at night and stuff like that and it's like and i think that's where we get into this question of you know the sheer number of unknown unknowns um and you know that's where you know i would argue that we should take a very clear precautionary approach especially to the moon given its importance to human heritage and the natural world uh, we need to be very careful that we don't uh, oh why have all the birds died oh because they don't know where they're going they keep flying into walls because they can't navigate anymore um as for coast bar yes this is this is a huge issue again it depends on where we're talking about um, the moon has a relatively low rating in, in the Coast Guard Planetary Protection Guidelines anyway, because it's considered to be a dead world. Although, you know, again, there's been some, there's some scientific speculation that it's maybe not as dead as we think it is. Um, you know, similarly, asteroids, you, know, you can more or less do anything you want with them. Um, but again, techniques are important. I was on a BB, I was on BBC in, Inside Science last week, and they were talking about Charles Kirkell's experiment using um, bacteria to conduct uh, asteroid mining. And you know, that's, that, that raises all sorts of Coast Bar red flags. So now, now you're introducing terrestrial organisms to other celestial bodies. Um, and I think, you know, again, this is one of those things that will be more relevant longer term um, because the sort of areas on Mars uh, that the astrobiologists and what have you are interested in are exactly where Elon Musk is gonna be going to try to get the water that his city is gonna need uh, in order to not die. Um, and so that's that's going to be a, a big thing we need to worry about. All right, I've got um, a question. This is like one of the this is this last question, and there's a big picture end question. So I know in the Artemis Accords, there's the safety zones mentioned, and then the Hague building blocks area based safety measures. So I was hoping that Chris, you could speak about these against the um, Article Two of the Outer Space Treaty, and Thomas speak about this in a more practical sense in terms of space governance as a whole. So Chris, if you want to speak on the treaty first and then we'll move into overall governance. Yeah, absolutely. Because I think the treaty makes it clear that, you know, to establish a, 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 an area where we are going in, but you are not going in, would clearly fall foul of, of the Article 2 provisions. And I think that is why when listening to Mike Gold, the uh, Space Court Foundation did a great discussion with Mike Gold uh, and, and several others talking about the, the Artemis Accords. And he was out of his way to say, these safety zones are not exclusions. They're not exclusion zones. And I think that's the that's the important distinction that, that, that needs to be made. What, when it becomes an exclusion zone, then we run into Article 2 compatibility problems. A safety zone is, right, this area here, we're doing this. 
you if you know if you're coming in here just be aware we're doing this and of course without that you're not complying with your article 9 duties so the safety zones can not only be said not to offend against article 2 but actually to be in the spirit of article 9 and i think that's the direction very much that the artemis accords have approached this with so i think what we're seeing is just an, a a, rec a recognition that the you know operations that are going to occur on the moon they're going to be dangerous we don't know you know we don't know whether there are there are chambers underneath the surface of the moon that that activity can trigger and that it would be a tragedy if if a crew got caught especially if that crew came from a hostile nation there could be all sorts of misunderstandings i think transparency is the key here providing the zones are transparent providing they're not permanent they're not fixed they're not exclusory then we're okay and in fact small thesis for you i actually think there is there is grounds to look at the use of these safety zones outside of the artemis accords i think we could there, there there's an opportunity to take what we've learned with the artemis accords and have normative behavior being shaped by those so i think we've got we've got issues there that international law can can learn and develop and, and build upon um i hope i haven't intruded too much in the the practical discussion thomas that's fine, and I'll, I'll intrude a bit on the legal discussion as well. I mean, uh, excluding countries from international spaces is a long problem in international law. I mean, Britain and America fought a war in 1812 over whether or not the Royal Navy had the right to exclude American shipping from, from European waters. And and one of the, you know, Britain got in a lot of trouble in 1982 for declaring a large chunk of the South Atlantic an exclusion zone. Um, so it's, it's a common problem. Um, and I think that's that's the key bit for the safety zones. For me, I've, I've long been raising sort of a, a potential red flag with say, the concept of safety zones because you know there are a lot of traps that you can fall into that it becomes de facto appropriation because you're saying you know, no one's allowed in, and especially if you're dealing with a mining operation that lasts decades, even centuries, um, and habit has a way or custom has a way of becoming a sort of permanent uh, fixture in its its appropriation by other means, and which is obviously something we want to avoid. Um, so the details will be key, um, and I think the the noises that we've heard from NASA are reassuring, and that that's not what they want to do. But you know, as I say, they are a practical necessity. You know, we are talking about doing dangerous operations. I think you know, I understand why the focus has been on mining, um, but I think you know we can talk about whether we, we change the name or not. But I think the concept is appropriate for almost any operation uh, that you might want to conduct in outer space. Um, and again, I think you know, up to now, you know, like NASA has basically had Mars to itself. Um, so it can coordinate its own operations with itself. But we're, you know, we're talking about the India's planning a Mars mission, you know, China's planning a Mars mission. Um, you know, we, we may have to start thinking about, well, you know, you stay on that side of the planet, we'll stay on that side of the planet, so we don't interfere with other operations. And that is in line with the, the Outer Space Treaty. Um, but to go back to what is becoming a recurring theme, you know, there's still so much we don't know. You know, do you need a 50 kilometer uh, exclusion zone, or do you need a 500 kilometer exclusion zone? And you know, and it might come down to different bodies have different rules because you know the way that dust interacts on a comet um, is different from the way it interacts on the surface of Europa. But if it, we've learned anything from, say, the Rosetta mission, um, or you know even the recent NASA uh, missions, is like still a, an awful lot we don't know about most of the solar system. All right. Um, so my last question is kind of multifaceted, but moving forward with what's done um, regarding the space resource utilization legal framework, what do you think has been has been done well? Um, what do you think could have been done better or differently now in hindsight? And what is the way forward to make sure that we have a stable space resource utilization legal framework? which I'm um, curious to think, would you say would can include the non-space, uh, I mean, sorry, the non-state actors, can they be involved in the governance process move forward? So what worked and what didn't work uh, that we've already dealt with legally and what is the way forward legally and can that include non-state actors? Um, Thomas, would you like to start? Um, to be honest with you, I think within the constraints of what was plausible, um, I, I think that it's the developments have been fine. Um, I think that you know there's there's we weren't going to have a conference of the parties of the outer space treaty to hash out an amendment or something like that or a new agreement uh, on space resources that was never realistic. 
we may ha we may see it at some point in the next 50 years. I mean, a, a proper conference of the parties of the Aerospace Treaty may be a good idea, regardless of whether we want to talk about space mining at that meeting or not. Um, but I also think it's, it's worth to look at how things have developed in other fields of international law. Um, a lot of references often made to Young Kloss and the law of the seabed uh, mining provisions, but people often forget that, you know, that those things come about until the 1980s. You know, it all sort of kicked, you know, in, in the 1950s when the territorial sea uh, definitions were changed. The United States did that unilaterally. You had the Truman Proclamation um, and then other countries followed suits with, again, unilateral declarations that this is now our, our territorial sea limit. Um, and the you know, then there were there were further developments over the decades. Before, and then we had the big UN conference of, OK, let's work everything out. Um, so I think you know, this is how international law develops. It's a messy, slow, very political process. Um, and, you know, we'll see. Um, I think the, the thing I'm more worried about is the potential pitfalls for the future. Um, but I don't think that's 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 not like it's not going to fail or, or you know, win or, or succeed or fail in outer space. It's the international system as a whole is facing these things. You know, if, if we wind up with the bifurcated uh, international order in which it's you know, the US led order versus the Chinese led order, uh, then we'll see that mirrored in outer space. And I don't think it's going to make a difference, you know, uh, like whether or not we, we agree on space mining. And just to kind of follow up on that, in terms of the contents of the of the Artemis Accords, we look and we see there hasn't been a lot of dispute on the contents. There's been a dispute on the forum. Should it have been here? Should it have been there? But the actual body of the of the Accords themselves, I don't think there's too much that's controversial in there. So I think they've captured the low hanging fruit very well. I also think they've captured the moment very well. I think that, the, that there is a time to do these things and a time not to do these things. If this had happened in 2016 or 2017, it would have fallen by the wayside. I think now that they captured the moment effectively. What would I have liked to have seen better? Well, it, it depends. Am I getting my, my, my sort of magic wand that I can wave and say that it would be, you know, make it, why don't we make it a partnership with Russia, make it a partnership with China, make it a partnership with all of the people who are likely to go to the moon, irrespective of you're involved in Artemis or not, and just say, these are the principles we're using in Project Artemis, we'd like you to adopt them, would you consider, you know, any way of, 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 of expanding out the field of potential actors, I think would have been, would have been fantastic. But again, I don't have my magic wand. It's the art of the possible. I know a heck of a lot of diplomacy went into the Artemis Accords as well. So kind of I'm asking for too much. I know I am. I always do near Christmas. It's the way I am. Um, but yeah, that, that's the sort of the summary I would say is it was as good as I think it could be. And it used the time well. It used the momentum well. It drew in from a lot of good stakeholders. So I think we've got a building block here. And I think, you know, we now have to see where those building blocks take us. Back to low predictability. All right. Well, I've got one question in the chat so far from Keith. 50, uh, 50 years after Apollo, we see a future in space is not inevitable. Your discussion about regime change in America confirms that national governance cannot be relied upon to create a spacefaring future even now. If becoming spacefaring is important, which you believe is, mo is morally imperative, what can the space law community do specifically to encourage non-state actors, private corporations to lead the way on building this future? And I guess that adds into us saying, like, what role do they have in this process moving forward? Because I think it's important to include them governance in the governance side. Um, Thomas, would you like to start? Um, yeah, it's going to defend the space law community here and say, I don't think we're the problem. Um, I think it's a financial problem ultimately. Um, if we look at the efforts that have failed, it comes down to not being able to raise money. And is that because their proposals are too ambitious? Um, you know, I, I've often made the reference with the, to the space resources people that you know they were building the gas stations before they'd even discovered the oil. Um, and it's it's you know. Yeah, we need you need infrastructure in place, and so maybe a more progressive approach uh, is necessary. And you're starting to see that now. The on-orbit servicing industry is becoming a thing. Um, you know, people are starting to talk about refueling in in Earth orbit. You've got country, companies like Astroscale, which are pioneering 
you know, rendezvous and proximity operations that are going to be necessary to create an, a proper in space economy. Um, and so maybe not trying to, you know, I think this is one of the things with Elon Musk and, you know, like he wants to build his million person city on Mars. And like that's way too ambitious for right now. You, you know, let's focus on building a space hotel in orbit first. Um, and then maybe you can start thinking about building a city on Mars. Uh, but also I think, you know, a different approach to financial instruments. I mean, a lot of, you know, I don't particularly like the colonial analogies, but I think one of the things to look at is that, you know, the East India Company pioneered the joint stock company. Uh, a lot of these colonial uh, colonial companies pioneered new financial instruments to pay for high risk long term ventures. Um, and so, you know, if these uh, space entrepreneurs are serious about uh, th these long term risky ventures, then they need us to be talking to the financial services industry and develop the, the, the new the new magic bond that's going to pay for this. Um, and, you know, whatever that might look like, I don't know. Um, but I think that's that seems to me to be where the problem really lies. Um, you know, law will come, law will develop, um, but it's it's the pain for it that seems to be the sticking point. If I can jump in, I think there's there's two specific things that I think we need to we need to be within the space law community specifically. We need to be better advocates. We need, and I know that may sound crazy because advocacy is what we do. But we need to get over that law isn't there as a blockage. If there's a law there, it's there for a reason. And it's there generally for, you know, for a, for a fairly good reason. They, it, 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 it's always placed, law's always seen as the, as the, as the bad person, the sort of the, the, the spectre at the feet of fear and trying to stop people doing what they really want to do. But I think that, that that's a misnomer, as Thomas said. The problem is often the lack of money to do it. Um, I also think we need to explain clearly the benefits of space travel, all of us in the space community. We need to we need to explain the benefit. Keith, you've put there that it's a moral imperative, and I think for most space advocates, we would see it as a moral imperative. But I don't think it's been accepted as a broad human value yet. And I think that's the advocacy issue that we have. Space is still seen as belonging to them. It's still seen as belonging to the Apollo generation, to, you know, the, the science fiction realm. It's not belonging to us. When it belongs to us, more people will have the say in it. More people will feel empowered by it. We need a diversity of voices in the space community. We need a diversity of nations in the space community. These aren't just tokenistic things. These are the way we get buy-in from the broader human community to get out there and really do stuff. Exactly. And I, I would to, to add to that, I, I think part of the advocacy problem is it's often seen as, you know, the, the, the question is often how does space help pro the actual problems we face on Earth? And, you know, we can talk about the, the, the sort of the fallacy of, of throwing money into outer space that disappears. But I think, you know, there are, you know, let's talk about the concrete solutions a bit more. And, and you know, I understand the desire to get sort of dreamy eyed about the, you know, O'Neill cylinders in, in the asteroid belt and what have you. Um, but it's like things about, you know, what Earth orbit helps people, uh, you know, operations in Earth orbit help people every day. Um, and, you know, if we can make that cheaper, if we can make space access cheaper, then, you know, that means we can do more of that and that can benefit. I mean, Lauren's done some work on, on the benefits of Earth or, or, or sustainable development goals, for example. And if, if we can sort of more clearly demonstrate uh, a linkage between you know developing outer space and developing earth whereas too often i feel the conversation often feels like we're trying to build a lifeboat um and you know we're going to flee to mars and good luck with earth um and and i think you know and maybe there are some people who genuinely believe that but i don't think that's that that's what the space community actually means when they talk about these things but i don't think we link it too much enough to caring about you know uplifting everybody um, it, and you know, we want it to be a rising tide that does lift everybody. We need to make sure that that's abundantly clear. Um, I think you know, other groups, again, to go back to the Hague group, um, there was some work done on the economic and social benefits uh, that space mining would have uh, for the world. And you know, we need more of that kind of, of stuff uh, rather than just to talking about, we're gonna make trillionaires by mining asteroids. 
Yeah, great question, Keith. Thank you so much. Um, and as I noticed in the chat, you say you didn't mean to imply law was a blockage. Absolutely not. We take that as read. It's a, it's a more general point that, you know, it sometimes can be seen as that. And we want it to be seen as empowering because I think it can be as well. I think a good, solid regulatory regime will mean that investors will have confidence. So absolutely great question. Thank you, sir. So I'm just going to wait a moment if anybody has any questions in the chat. If not, we will wrap up soon. But I want to make sure you have a chance to to pose your questions to Thomas and Chris. Um, in the meantime, I guess I would say uh, maybe you both can tell me what's your favorite thing about space resource utilization and why are you interested in looking at this part of the, the space regime? Can I jump in there? Because I want to ask you a question, Lauren. Okay. I, you've been you've been talking about you've been talking about the norms and the values that you've seen that we've seen in the Artemis Accords and that we've seen develop. And I know you've done a bucket load of work on this and the way in which norms have developed in low Earth orbit. Do you see any sort of parallels? Do you see do you see norms developing sort of at equal pace? Do you see that there's a difference? I mean, what what do you think from from your perspective and the the, the work that you're doing? Well, definitely I don't know very much about space resource utilization, but if I take the idea that what I'm looking at in terms of the of the norms in low Earth orbit, for example, that we should be thinking about space debris mitigation and that they should be in part of the licensing um, procedures at the national level. And then, of course, this 25 year rule that they're trying to keep satellites, you know, having an actual concrete end of life procedure. If we're going to start using the moon, I'm assuming any resource utilization activity probably will also have satellites involved in some capacity. And if we have humans there on a more routine basis. So I'd like to hope that these ideas of space mitigation, end of life procedures, using a licensing regime with environmental checklists will still apply to moon orbit, cis lunar space, Mars orbit, because what we are learning from low Earth orbit and GEO additionally, and, and how supportive the International Telecommunications Union has been on the idea of harmful interference, non-harmful interference, how close is too close for you know supporting satellites, all of these kind of factors, I'm hoping will carry over to the orbits of the moon and Mars as well, because it shouldn't be a, an, um, a reinvent the wheel. It should be take what's working from what we have and while we're still trying to make it better for Earth orbits, we should be doing the same for the Moon and Mars. So I would say these kinds of norms would be great, but let's also hope that we're not using the emerging norm that it might be okay to do an anti-satellite test and assume we could do the same for the Moon and Mars. So there's some also to watch out for um, that I think is, is just as critical. Um, oh, we've got another question. This is a five years after meeting like future I guess what do you think the state of play will be in five or ten years more time after the five year let's say bracket now so the longer term um, Thomas um, I think five years I don't know that there'll be a huge amount in, in five years I think ten years is probably a more realistic timeline um, you know I, I think hopefully we will have seen um, an actual return to the moon um, Fingers crossed it's the United States, but you know, there are other countries uh, that are also looking at a, a lunar mission. Uh, so the US may get get beaten to the moon. Um, it would be good if even just as like a proof of concept uh, thing, you know, that return involves some form of ISRU. Um, I can, you know, because it would be it would be good to say, look, it works. It's a good idea. Um, but I don't think we'll see the sort of revolutionary developments that we've seen over the past five years, um, unless, I don't know, the Biden administration hits on a, a, a string of successes and we get a new treaty or something, but that's that's pretty unrealistic, I think. <laughs> yeah, I think um, I'd, if, if, if I'm crystal ball gazing, all I've got at the minute is smoke and confusion. Um, but hopefully, five years time, we will have humans getting close to the moon let's say that with 10 years time humans actually back on the moon um we'll see again a greater diversity of space actors a great diversity of of players in the space game of you know companies of scientific organizations of nations working a lot more collaboratively we'll we'll see the benefits of space being really transmitted 
and we'll may we may even see convergence over actually you know these these things are good ideas so we'll see norms being developed that you know we would regard as being as being positive and as being helpful and as being useful and beneficial all right we have another question it says can we have a realistic model for governing space exploration companies mm. so this is where i think i run my altruism runs into problems because of course we know what companies want to do companies want to make money that's why they exist so their natural foe is regulation their natural enemy is is the is is the regulatory body which says you've got to do this you've got to do that you've got to do this because that impinges on their monies now again going back to what i was saying keith actually a good regulatory regime can actually enable them because they've got a solid base of operations, predictable partners, predictable environments, predictable sort of investment returns. So it can, it, if, if, if companies embrace that, then I think we can see a nice orderly expansion. Unfortunately, my experience tells me that what we'll see is, is, is chaos. We'll see opportunity, opportunism. We'll see, you know, a, a, a seeking of the commercial advantage because that's what companies do. So, is there a model for governing space exploration companies? My thoughts, my thoughts are going to be that we've kind of got the licensing regime and that's going to have to, we're going to have to put our faith in nation states to make sure that they are good harvesters of the resources because if we leave it to the companies, the companies won't want to do it. I think the, the law of the sea model isn't bad. It has some issues and some of that are artifacts of the fact that it was originally developed in the 1970s and then uh, sort of hacked uh, portions out of it in the 1990s. Um, but I think that would be a reasonably good starting point, um, although accepting the fact that, you know, it is 40 years old now and, and the world has changed a bit. Um, I think the corporate governance bit is the bit that's more interesting to me. And particularly because if you look at like planetary resources in deep space industries and not to kick them while they're down and dead, um, but you know, their, their approach seemed to be, uh, you know, doing everything, um, start to finish. Um, and if you look at terrestrial mining operations, um, that's not how they work. You know, they're, the companies that do the exploring, who go out and find the resources, are often different from the companies who do who dig the resources out of the ground and, and sell, put it on market. And then they're different from the companies who process the resources. And then they're different from the companies who sell the resources. Now, they might all be linked under an umbrella corporation, but I think that's one of the things that we need to think about. And this sort of goes back to the, the idea of you know, progressivism shouldn't be a bad word for us, is that you know there is a, there is stages to this. And maybe your company should focus on one portion of that stage. Um, and yeah, OK, maybe in time you can become a conglomerate that does it all through different vehicles. Um, but there's often this obsession in the space industry of, you know, we're going to do everything from start to finish. And that's there's a reason why most industries don't work that way. I think I'll chime in because I've been doing some research on governance models. So there are currently that I've been reading 18 plus different governance models that are um, used theoretically or practically. And I can tell you that the traditional hierarchical command and control that you're sort of seeing from the the old days of the space um, industry, you know, with post Cold War, that's starting to change. I can assure you we're not probably going to move to a self governance where the companies are kind of doing whatever they want, however they want, because we we just um, don't operate that way in the outer space regime. But I do think that the regime is evolving enough that there could be room for another model of governance to come in and kind of bridge that gap between command and control and self-governance. So I think that we've got room to kind of find the way that works. And I'd like to caveat and say that what works for the holistic outer space regime may not be the exact same model of governance for like what I'm looking at, low Earth orbit, which may also then be tweaked to be different for the moon or what we um, are using in the geostationary orbit, for example. So I think that there are going to be many different versions of governance that will all be kind of interwoven together to create what we have as the overarching outer space regime. So yes, there could be a realistic model, but we just don't know exactly what it's going to look like yet because we're still growing and evolving as a regime in, in totality anyway. 
Um, I don't see any other questions, so I guess at this point, if either one of you have any last thoughts or you want to wrap up, or um, Thomas, also, if you'd like to talk about what's going to be done through the center to continue this discussion, as well as anything else in the Beyond Earth Orbit, Earth Orbit program, that would be great. So Chris, I'll let you wrap up first, then Thomas, you can kind of do both the wrap up on the topic plus what we're doing at the center. Fantastic. Well, Lauren, firstly, thanks to you for such great hosting and moderation. Um, and Thomas, thank you for providing a really fascinating paper that I think gives insights into all of the issues that we've been talking about, but in a great depth and real sort of a, a really pressing and, and prominent way. So, so congratulations and thank you for having me here. And I think this is, as you say, this isn't even the foreword of the start of the discussion. We are at the we're at the front cover with the nice shiny pictures. So hopefully we're going to be having many more conversations like this with you know more inclusive, diverse voices, with more interesting people than myself. But fantastic, a wonderful job. And thank you so much for having me here. Yeah. Um, yeah thank you to Lauren and Chris for, for joining me. Um, obviously, you know, the center is about to enter into its fourth year now. Uh, which is very exciting. Um, I mean, there's there's loads of the, to, to write about. Um, I'm currently contemplating the sort of security implications of, of space resource utilization, um, particularly, you know, the sort of imbalances that it might introduce into the geopolitical order. Um, so that's that's a bit perhaps a bit bigger paper than, than this primer might be. Um, but that's the thing to, to keep an eye out for. Um, I think you know read read the the primer, but also you know read some of the other things that have been put out. You know the the Hague Space Resources Governance Working Group, um, not just the building blocks, but the commentary that com accomplishes it. Uh, there's there's a lot to think about. Um, you know, and I, we we will, we will keep having these discussions. Um, I think you know assuming Copius goes ahead uh, next year, which you know it's still I think a bit of a question mark. Um, you know I I expect there'll be some fascinating and probably quite heated. Uh, discussions, particularly at the legal subcommittee, and so that that could be interesting. And yeah, I think it will be fascinating to see what happens with uh, President Biden's administration. I think one of the big things to watch out for is who he selects as NASA administrator. Um, I've heard some rumors. Um, I mean, my money's on Laurie Garver, um, but <laughs> we'll we'll have to see. Um, so check out the paper. It should be on our website. Uh, if the thing worked uh, well, I will be checking to make sure that it is. I also think I, I emailed it to everybody uh, through through Eventbrite. Uh, so yeah, read it, uh, talk about it. Um, you know, it's it's a fascinating topic, and there's there's only going to be loads more to talk about. So hopefully, we'll have another one in the not too distant future. Thank you all for attending. Don't forget, you can find us on social media. You can join us to help us out from donations through Patreon. We have a podcast series and a blog, and we're always talking about different things in terms of beyond Earth orbit and the other side space and sustainability in space as well as for earth and society so there's a lot of different things we'd love to have feedback from you if you're interested to talk more about these topics you can find our website and we're always available on twitter have a lovely evening slash afternoon wherever you may be and uh, please stay safe in these trying times and thank you for your attendance <laughs>